Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Ken Biberai. I'm an Executive Managing Director at Savills, a global commercial real estate firm, and the host of Coffee with Ken, a thought leadership series at the nexus of business and politics. We are thrilled today to have a dynamic, exciting conversation on the soul of America. And today was really made possible with the support and vision of Billy Halleck and CAA speakers. So I'd like to invite Billy up to say a few words and tell us about what CAA is up to. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I want to start certainly by saying, um, uh, obviously, welcome to all of you that came. But thank you very much to uh, Daniel Schmucker and, and Rhett Wilson and, and Ken for partnering with us on this event. Um, one of the reasons why we wanted to do something like this and one of the reasons why we wanted to do it now um, is because we all know one thing for, for sure and certain. We may disagree on a lot of things, but I think we can all agree on the fact that it's going to be an, an uh, interesting election cycle. Um, and at CAA, we are in the business of bringing people together to, to talk about the most important topics. That's what we do um, in the speaker's department of, of, of which I work in uh, at CAA. And so we wanted to let everyone know that CAA is here in Washington, D.C. Uh, a lot of times when people think of CAA, they think of the Hollywood sign and the Hollywood Hills and actors and actresses and those things. And, and while that is true, and, and while the mothership is in L.A., we have a beautiful office here that we opened um, a couple of years back uh, under a, 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 a different firm. But now that we're here at CAA, we have fully staffed it out, and we're here at 1500 K Street. And I say that because we understand how this inside the Beltway ecosystem is different than any place else in the country. We understand that um, not everyone gets it, and sometimes uh, our perceptions of what the Hollywood people may think or may not understand about our business um, can, can, can maybe lead us to have different perceptions. But we live here. Not only is CAA uh, present in, in D.C., but we are present in D.C. And by that I mean our agents live here. We work here, we've grown up here. Um, I'm in the speaker's department again, and I have a couple of colleagues, Krista Spatafor in the back and Christine Lantzman, and between the, the three of us, we've got, oh gosh, over 50 years of experience in this business and in this town. Um, we have other colleagues, uh, Judy Ann Williams is, is back there who, who runs all of, of impact for CAA. I have another colleague, Rafe, I don't know if Rafe is here, I didn't see him yet, um, who's in the books department. But I say this all to say that we are here. We understand what you do. We understand how this, this ecosystem works inside the Beltway. And, and we just want to make sure that as we bump into you over the course of time at other events and other events that we plan, uh, that you stop us and you say hello and you consider us partners, especially when it comes to this, the speaking side of things. I, I have to give a quick plug uh, to, to our business. Any of you that are, are um, responsible for or work with people who are responsible for bringing in speakers, uh, to impact your conferences, your meetings, or whatever, um, we're the people to call. And uh, I'll make sure that, that we kind of connect over the course of time. But I've spent too much time up here uh, telling you why we did this. And um, I just would like to, again, thank John, who is the, the greatest client any agent could ever oh, represent. Yeah. And, uh, and, Definitely. And, and thank Ken for putting this together. So again, I'm going to remind you of that. I'm going to remind you of that when it comes time for the commission. I believe that. <laughs> I just cost myself 5% on that, but it's okay. Uh, you guys enjoy the day. Thank you so much. No, no, he, he you know. <laughs> thank you, Billy. But, but to his credit, I mean, Julia Roberts, Kerry Washington, Al Pacino. Who John cares Meacham. about Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, like the yeah. Company, John, yeah. The company you keep. Yeah, um, it's dork diversity. <laughs> dork diversity. Well. <laughs> it's the only way I'm a diverse hire. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, we're here in the Decatur House yep. in partnership with the White House Historical Association. So I just want to take a moment. We started this series during the pandemic. It was virtual. And this is really kind of a climactic event for us to be here in person on these sacred grounds mm to have such a discussion with you yeah. about the soul of America. Thank you. And before we jump in, I just spent a lot of time reading your books, and, and I was kind of shocked that there's really not a lot of reference to coffee and the impact that caffeine had on these leaders. I mean, is no. this a whole thing? Well, linear... I'm working on the Albanian okay. edition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Next, next, Touché. next edition, yeah. Touche. So diving in, you wrote Soul of America, and it coincided yeah. around the time that President Biden launched his campaign, and a large theme of his yeah. was about fighting for the soul of America and this kind of consistent theme and, and you two go way back. Can you talk a little bit about what you tried to accomplish with this book and then also maybe segue into what the president was trying to accomplish and, and communicate with his election in 20? Sure, I wrote this book because of Charlottesville. Uh, Sunday afternoon after the riots there um, 
and the death of Heather Heyer. Uh, we got a phone call from my old uh, friend and editor of Time Magazine, uh, Nancy Gibbs, who asked me to do a piece for that week about moments in history that had felt like this. And there have been many. Uh, chaos is the exception, not the rule in American life. Uh, there's a natural human impulse to recast uh, 20 minutes ago as better than now. Uh, it's the whole function of once upon a time, uh, a storytelling device that has a certain pedigree. But that doesn't mean it's true. Uh, natural human tendency does not necessarily equate to accuracy. So I, I wrote this piece uh, fairly quickly, and it stuck with me, uh, this idea of what makes this moment similar and dissimilar uh, to, to others. And my own view of this, and I think, uh, when I think, uh, I think uh, historically and theologically. Uh, look, I'm a boringly white Southern male heterosexual uh, Episcopalian, right? There are only six of us left. Uh, <laughs> we stick together. Uh, but I do believe that democracy is a human undertaking. I believe that without an appreciation of our appetites and our ambitions and how those are in conflict with our impulses toward kindness and, and grace and giving as well as taking, uh, if we don't see each other as neighbors, democracy doesn't work. Now, when I say neighbor, you start to think probably about Mr. Rogers. Um, so let me tell you a quick story about a very short category called great tweets. It's like French military victories in the 20th century, right? It won't, it won't take long. Um, about six months ago, someone tweeted out that if Doris Kearns Goodwin and Mr. Rogers had had a one-night stand, I would have resulted. And <clears throat> I thought it was great, right? Doris, to be honest, was kind of pissed off. Uh, so she learned how to use the cell phone. And so she yeah. called up and she said, couldn't Mr. Rogers and I have, this is a true story, couldn't Mr. Rogers and I have fallen in love and you were the fruit of our union? I said, no, sweetheart. He picked you up in the C-SPAN bar. Yes. That's, that, that's it. So anyway, but if we don't see each other as neighbors, uh, it doesn't work. And it's, we've been doing this since the third chapter of Genesis, right? If democracy were easy, everybody would do it. This would not be the oldest functioning constitutional democracy. Uh, but it is. And to me, the soul of the country is like our soul. And you all are better people than I am. That's not hard, so don't get cocky. Uh, but I suspect that if you do the right thing 51% of the time, that's a pretty good day. And I suspect that maybe some of the time you don't do exactly what you think you, you know you should do. Why would the country be any different? It's the fullest manifestation of all of us. And so the moment we find ourselves in is, I think, I think it's remarkable that it took this long for this to unfold. Certainly it would have surprised the founders. Hamilton thought this was gonna happen. Jefferson feared this. It's one of the few things they agreed on. And so the rule of law is at stake. Although I gotta, I gotta say, just parenthetically, there's been something, I'm not, and I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. Uh, you mentioned President Biden, he's my friend, I help him when I can, but if you had told me seven years ago that I would think that there was a, that I would have any partisan identification, I would have been surprised. I have voted for Republicans for president, I voted for Democrats for president, I'm George H.W. Bush's biographer, I'm George W. Bush's biographer, and I'm on MSNBC, so you figure it out, right? <laughs> Uh, but I do believe in this constitutional order, and not just because I'm the boringly heterosexual white Southern male Episcopalian for whom things work out. I believe in the Constitution because it has created the capacity for us to actually realize the promise of the Declaration that was written and a promise that we made, that people like me made, and no one made us do it. No one said found the country on an idea. We could have done it on anything. But Jefferson wrote the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English voluntarily. Now, all men are created equal. Now, I know when I say most important sentence ever originally rendered in English, that seems hyperbolic. And it is a little like the um, story about the inmate from Texas here. 
Oh, uh, you're going to enjoy this. Um, uh, so there, there, you, there was a Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish in the public schools and said on the stump one day, if English is good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. So yeah, uh, I told George W. Bush that story when he was governor. He said, <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, that's pretty funny, asshole. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure we're talking about the soul of America. Yes, but, um, <laughs> But I, I think that I think it's it's a it's touch and go. Yeah, and I think as you read through your various uh, publications, a lot of it has to do with the near misses, and I think that kind of mm. gets to this fifty-one percent. I mean, how have you teased out? I mean, how hard has it been to preserve this democracy over this period of time? Well, I mean, we're coming up on two hundred fifty years in two years, right? How are we doing? Well, are we? Yeah. Are we, Ken? Um, <laughs> uh, are we two hundred fifty years old? Are we four hundred years old? the 1619, or, I submit to you, are we 55 years old, 56 years old? American democracy was not officially multiracial until 1965. We're 10 minutes old, right? So we lived out of compliance with the Declaration of Independence for more than a century. We fought I love when people say, oh, everything's always worked out. Tell it to Gettysburg, yeah. right? I grew up on Missionary Ridge, a Civil War battlefield in Chattanooga. I could still find Civil mm -hmm. War bullets in my yard during Watergate, right? This is a very short story. And I think, therefore, it's at once thrilling and terrifying. It's thrilling because it means it's up to us. In the lifetime, dare I say it, of a number of people in the room, the country moved from legalized segregation and voter suppression and separate public facilities, segregated interstate travel until 1965. And suddenly, you know, this, you know, this fella in New York is, the, is, is, is this existential threat. He is, but we get what we deserve. We were not invaded by aliens. You know, these, these, this is not a flying saucer that came from Trump Tower. We enabled this, and we can choose. We have chosen to be polarized, right? And I know you're thinking, social media and cable news. Well, don't watch it. Yeah. It's not that, not incredibly hard. And the reason people watch it is it's entertaining. It's cheeseburgers. If people wanted broccoli, guess what? There would be restaurants where you could drive up and buy broccoli. <laughs> there are not a lot of those. But there are a lot of cheeseburgers. And here's the good news. Because we have chosen to believe different realities, we can choose not to. There's an incredible amount of agency that we have surrendered to a general sense of malaise and despair. And I think it, whenever that happens, I just submit to you that when John Robert Lewis walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Sunday, March 7th, 1965, willing to die for the Declaration of Independence and the Gospel of the New Testament, he was not despairing. And he was not cowering because Sean Hannity might be mean to him. Why, would, why should anyone else? So, picking up on the cheeseburger analogy, right? Like, there's a lot. It's of, a good analogy. There's a lot of places that have cheeseburgers. Yeah. There's also kind of been a lot of books written about Lincoln, but you took a totally different angle. You know, I was yours. misinformed about that. Oh. I didn't know that Lincoln had been covered. <laughs> uh, there's been a few other biographies. Yeah, I've heard but, that. But you set out, and, and it really feels like the the theme was was really around the why. Right, and I'd love to kind of get your thoughts. That's on, exactly on right. That. Exactly right. My, my, and how do you find the why on somebody who's uh, you? Uh, you cross-examine them. It's like the C-SPAN meets shi The Shining, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, you sort of try to talk to dead people. Um, so what I think you have to do, my, my, my mother, Doris, um, I'm um, wrote the most brilliant book about how Lincoln did what he did, right? Team of rivals, political genius. I was more interested in the why. Because if you are a politician, 
you can always talk yourself into the opposite course that you took, right? Most things are, I mean, Hitler was not a close call, uh, slavery not a close call, but most of the time you can sort of say, well, I'm going to wait until I have the votes. I'm going to wait X number. I'm going to do it next term. You can always talk yourself into that. Lincoln did not. <clears throat> In fact, he risked everything, I think, at three critical moments for a moral principle, the moral principle of it, the anti-slavery principle. Not necessarily immediate abolition, but anti-slavery. Uh, one of the great moments that I think we don't appreciate is how close the country came to being fundamentally changed in the winter of 1860-61. There was a compromise on the table from a senator from Kentucky, uh, John Crittenden, that would have uh, expanded slavery into Arizona and New Mexico, would have avoided war, uh, would have bought probably two decades. Uh, and with all respect, what do people in Washington do? They compromise. You take the deal. It was a pretty good deal by pol conventional political standards. But Lincoln said no. And why did he say no? Because he believed that if any, that any affirmation of a pro-slavery principle would be catastrophic. And that the people from my native region in the American South were never going to be satisfied. He actually understood appeasement and appetite in a way that Neville Chamberlain and others did not appreciate well enough in a different continent in a different time. He knew that if, in fact, slavery went into Arizona and New Mexico, and the idea was, well, they, 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 the, the geography was such that you couldn't uh, have huge plantations, fine, but then the principle collapses. And we know where the border is, but they didn't. Four presidential administrations heading into Lincoln's had tried to acquire Cuba. They wanted Nicaragua. There had been a filibuster. A private army had taken over Nicaragua and reinstituted slavery in 1857. There was, do you remember the phrase, the Knights of the Golden Circle? John Wilkes Booth was a Knight of the Golden Circle. It was like the Proud Boys, but like they read hardback books, but it was like that, right? <laughs> they, the Golden Circle was a slave, that was funny, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's my grandpa. Uh, the Golden Circle was, a pro -sla was gonna be a slave empire with Havana at the center. And we know that the political capital of the Confederacy was Montgomery and Richmond, but their vision was that it would be in Havana, and that would be the cultural political center of an entirely different nation. That was the Confederate project. It wasn't just to be with the SEC, right? It was to expand beyond that. And Lincoln understood yeah. it, and he said no, and risked everything. And then in 1864, he wouldn't take emancipation off the table uh, when he was told right across the way. The chair, here's how long ago this was. The chairman of the Republican National Committee was the editor of the New York Times. It's like the Peloponnesian War, right? Uh, Henry Raymond, he came down, he said, you know, you'll lose. And if you don't say that emancipation is negotiable, and Lincoln said, I cannot ask men to put on the eagle, the brass eagle of the, civil, of the Union soldiers, and say, we'll re-enslave you. And, and then Sumter, Winfield Scott and others didn't want him to reinforce Sumter. They didn't think it was worth it. And he said no. And so why did he do that? He did it because he believed that slavery was wrong. Hmm. And sometimes they actually believe what they say. The White House Historical Association actually takes a leading role in funding and organizing presidential portraits and you've spent a little bit of time talking about oil portraits and how these leaders yeah. need to stop and maybe think about their oil portrait. What, what do you mean by that? And what are some examples of maybe leaders like Lincoln yeah. between the first inaugural and the second and Johnson stepping up with the magnitude of the office and maybe Yeah, the, I call it the, I, uh, when I'm lucky enough to talk to politicians, uh, I call it the portrait test. Mike Johnson just passed the portrait test, yeah. parenthetically. And he said it. He said it. He said, I want to be on the right side of history, which one of the things I, so the portrait test is, what do you want us to think when we look at your portrait? 
Politicians love that because they can't imagine a world where we are not looking at their portraits, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody, but it works for politicians. Um, and so the other thing is that most of us get a sentence if we get that, right? Lincoln saved the union. FDR gets a compound sentence, right? You don't get much. LBJ, great at home, bad at, bad at Vietnam. Um, I think politicians, public figures, and it's easy for me to say, because I'm, I'm not one, I'm not on ballots, but I think they should, and I also believe we should as citizens, so I do do this, we should govern to our obituary, <laughs> right? What do you want the verdict to be in the end? And try to that. Now, I don't know if you can use PowerPoint and all that. This is kind of, this is kind of a Washington crowd. Y'all do that. <laughs> I have a friend who says, those who use PowerPoint have neither, which I've always, um, which I've always loved. I've, uh, I, may, I may at some point just steal it. A great line. <laughs> uh, but um, but what, is, what do you want us to remember? Do you want us to remember that, I mean, who here, <clears throat> is there anyone in American life who would not want to have been on the Pettus Bridge on the right side? Can you imagine what your life would be like? Can you imagine the stories you could tell? Can you imagine the pride your children and grandchildren would have in you if you had been on the right side of that struggle? I come from a part of the world where people who look like me, who came from the part of that world that I came from, weren't necessarily with the troopers, with the tear gas and the clubs, but we weren't on the bridge either, hmm. right? We weren't. And I like to think I would have been, but if everyone who thinks they would have been had been, they wouldn't have had to be there, mm. right? Hmm. So one of the points of history is as a case study in what to do and not do. And so we are facing, without being partisan, and I'm not, we are facing a not dissimilar moment where the appetites and ambition of one interest, one party, one person, in fact, are trying to warp and shift the entire journey toward a more perfect union into a journey toward personal power for one person. And I don't need to tell anybody who was in Washington on January 6, 2021, what that is, right? And so the portrait test is when you look at your, think about it. You know, your kids, your grandkids, when they, when they take that 30, 40 seconds to talk about you at Thanksgiving, what do you want them to say? And I think if you govern to that, if you act to that, I think we end up with that more perfect union. When you go out to write one of your books and your subject, you've had Lincoln and Jefferson and historical figures, but you've also had President George H.W. Bush and now... George W. Bush, after they've left office, helping document their journey. Yeah. But you're also spending a little bit of time just down the street. Yeah. Are you working on a potential book related to President Biden? And how is it different kind of documenting and, and teasing out a biography when the person's still alive and sharing and opening up with you and you have that dialogue? Yeah. How, how is your work different? Yeah, it, it's very interesting. If, you're, if you do what I do for a living, this is fascinating, right? Uh, and I'm incredibly fortunate. Um, the, George H.W. Bush book, it took me 17 years. It was supposed to be posthumous, but the son of a bitch wouldn't die. <laughs> and, uh, I'd bring it up, he'd say, not gonna do it. <laughs> um, as Dana Carvey once said, the key to doing the old man's voice was Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. Oh my God. Perfect, oh my perfect, God. perfect description. <laughs> Y'all remember when uh, General Petraeus had the affair with his biographer? Remember that? Well, I called the president. I said, sir, he said, I think you're cute, but don't, don't, we're not going to do it. <laughs> uh, what I like to think is that, and I have fellow practitioners who disagree with this, but I like to think that if Jefferson, but the, the, the easy answer to your question is, it's difficult because you know them and you might not be mm -hmm. as 
directing your judgments. I, my view is that I hope that if Jefferson or Lincoln or Jackson could read these books somehow that I do, that they would think it was a fair thing. And so I don't suffer from that. Okay. Um, with, with both Bushes, I mean, we come from the same kind of tribe, right? And so wasps are not, we're not well known for our introspection. It's like, where's the vermouth? You know, that's really kind of all we do. Um, that's the most searching question we ask sometimes. So what's, what has been interesting about it is not that they've said something particularly, that, mm -hmm. they've said some newsworthy stuff, but it's the ability to be with them and then imaginatively take them back to moments of decision, mm -hmm. right? And so I can see what, the old man was like with Gorbachev. You know, I can, I, I get it. Mm -hmm. You know that that you know that big hand. Uh, I mean, I, I so I had this view of of, of the forty first president. Uh, I was an undergraduate through most of his presidency, and I sort of had this nineteen ninety two um, campaign view of him to some extent. Um, I went to a place called the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee. There may be one or two of you who don't know it. Um, it's best understood as a combination of Downton Abbey and Deliverance. Uh, so, and my roommate, my roommate was a guy from Lynchburg, Tennessee, named Jack Daniels. So, I was very fuzzy about the whole Gulf War. I thought it had to do with Destin. I didn't have any idea. But I met, as, I, as many of you probably did, but about seven minutes after meeting George H. W. Bush, I totally got it. Right? You, if you have to find someone in whose hands you trust the fate of everything in a nuclear age, George Herbert Walker Bush was a plausible choice, right? He was just, there was a quiet, persistent charisma. And part of what I wanted to do with, with the book was try to explain how does a quietly, persistently charismatic figure lose the thread publicly, mm. as he did, as he did. Uh, to answer your question on, no, I don't want to do a book on President Biden. Uh, I don't want to profit in any way uh, from, from this, again, I, friendship. Um, I don't, again, I, I'm not a big policy guy. Uh, I pay plenty of taxes. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> but I believe that in the binary world in which we live, and we live in a fallen world, fallen, frail, and fallible, do I wish there were all a bunch of other perfect candidates and, you know, we had a center-right Brookings Institution person and a center-left, you know, uh, person from the Kennedy School? Sure. But we don't. We don't live in that world. Uh, this is what we have. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it's a vital election. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other thing about the presidency, and this is an appropriate setting to mention this. And I knew this intellectually, and I knew it a little bit in a tactile sense from knowing the Bushes, but I now really get it. The presidency is like an iceberg. We see this little tiny bit of it. Imagine a world where you wake up every morning and the briefers come in to tell you how the world could end by lunch, right? That's what they do. It's been remarkable. Were we off the record? No, no, we have cameras. Uh, <laughs> I guess not. Um, I, when, you, when you talk to President Biden, it is remarkable how central the foreign policy questions are to him in a way that it, it, I think is almost certainly not true of an ordinary person. I can go a week and not think about Ukraine, right? Again, I told you I'm not a very good person. I wish I did. <laughs> but the first thing, you know, if you, if you find yourself chatting with the president, that's what he's thinking about because it's the entire security of the West with, un with amazingly, we wish they were unimaginable consequences. And so, Democracy, democratic citizenship, 
requires, I think, an appreciation of the stakes and the burdens mm. that these folks carry. And that's why it's so important, and this, I mean, to say this to you all is, it seems pointless, but I mean, you know this, but if you don't get it right on the front end, God help us, because they don't change. They don't change when they're off. They, 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 it's too hard. And their policies change. But the fundamental character, they haven't got time to go sit and read three books about mm. the balance of power, right? You're, we're hiring someone to govern according to certain characteristics that we have to do our best to discern. And when people are self-evidently one way or the other way, it's self-evident, you know? And so the, to count on somehow another that, well, it's all gonna change, I just have noticed mm -hmm. it, it's just not. There's just too much pressure. So if you were to do a little <clears throat> assessment of where the president is today, and even thinking back to George H.W. Bush riding yeah. high after the Gulf War, President's had some pretty large legislative accomplishments from the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. CHIPS Act, you know, infrastructure bill. It seems like there's a lot to kind of talk about, but also seems to be a bit of a disconnect potentially with the American voter. How do you yeah, assess? Yeah, there is. I mean, sure, uh, there is. I mean, you all know the political realities uh, as well or better th than I do. President Biden, so it's sort of fast. So you all are historically minded or you wouldn't be here. Um, we have great coffee, though. So I mean, there's, well, there is that. There's, that. there's yeah. the coffee. Um, think about it. Joe Biden has been in the federal service at the end of this calendar year for 52 years. 36 years in the Senate, eight years as vice president. Well, 48 years, uh, and four years as president. Right. There were. T.R., Clinton, Kennedy, and Obama were younger than that when they became president. It's just different. And the country, it's, it's, the country can decide, you know, on the age thing. I will say this, I've rarely, if you all think about this, have you all ever, can you recall a moment where a prevailing political narrative disappeared as quickly as Biden's age, I could come back to this afternoon, but the, when he walked in to give the State of the Union, that was the story, and it's now been six weeks, I haven't seen a single thing. It's just, it's just interesting, I, just, I don't know quite why, but it's interesting. Um, I, yes, I mean, the, the, the legislative achievements are remarkable, the implications will be, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see go, going forward. Um, one of the things that's part of the iceberg issue with the presidency is presidents don't get credit for keeping bad things from happening, hmm. right? George H.W. Bush is the great example of that. The president, president Bush used to start conversations by saying, I don't want to make this worse, whatever it was. And that's a genuine kind of conservatism. That's Edmund Burke. George Herbert Walker Bush was far more classically conservative than either Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush in the classical sense, right? Reagan and George W. Bush were conservative reformers. They were activists. So that, that is not the same kind of conservatism. Uh, President Biden is a center-left, Delaware, border state, Democratic politician who's been doing this almost as long as I've been alive. And it's what you see is what you get. That's the remarkable thing about President Biden. There may be a dark side, but I've never seen it. <laughs> and there's very little, I don't wanna say totally, but 90% of what I've heard him say in private, he would say in public, right? It, to the point where, you know, you sort of you were talking to the president, you know. <laughs> And you're thinking, well, he just confided in me. And then you turn on and he says the same thing to Anderson Cooper. <laughs> you know, it's like, that kind of that undercut my self. You know, here I am thinking I'm Martin Sheen. Oh, wow. And, you know, he's like telling him, telling Brian Lamb. But um, anyway, so I, I just, look, he's a good man. 
Uh, his opponent has shown what he is. You all know where I stand. Uh, I think it's where we should stand. Is it perfect? No. But again, we've been doing this since the third chapter of Genesis, right? They told us not to take something. We took it. We've been paying the price. <laughs> so to close it out, we do have a large business audience, people watching at home. Is there a call to action or, or certain traits that you've kind of recognized from yeah. your subjects that you would pass on and suggest, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting time for corporate leaders. The world is always oh. evolving post-COVID, et cetera. There's just like a lot on leaders beyond the public sphere that they're thinking about. Like, and your lessons, I feel like, are just as applicable to business leaders. In the, the the, the, to me, the lesson for, again, all of us, whether it's business or citizenship or politics is what do you want us to say about you? Hmm. What, what, what's, the, what's the legacy question? And that tends, seems to me, tends to affect, if that's the incentive, that affects your behavior. And what do we honor in this country? To whom do we build monuments and memorials? It's to builders, not destroyers. It's mm. to liberators, not captors. It's to people who expand possibility, not those who constrict it. It just is. And I'm not saying that that has a partisan element, except it kind of does right now. I mean, parenthetically, if the Republican Party had nominated Nikki Haley, I think she'd be ahead by five to eight to 10 points. Mm. I don't think anything's be particularly close. And so if it were really about the policies? Interesting. OK. Um, so this, again, this is, and what, look, I live in Tennessee. When I say I have conservative friends, that's redundant. <laughs> right? I mean, you know. So I'm not, this is not a crazy sort of yeah. left-wing thing. What it is is what do we want this generation to be known for? And to have faced down a uh, illiberal authoritarian streak in the country that has always been with us, but has never had quite this purchase on so many people, that's what's different. It's the scale. It's not the impulse. The impulse is always there. Mm -hmm. right? um, that's a great story. What is our story? That's, that's, that's the essential thing. Yeah. And citizens can decide it. Look, we incentivize the political behavior, right? Uh, so what is the story? And I want the story to be a more perfect union, mm -hmm. not the triumph of one tribe over another. John Meacham. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we, we were obviously very grateful for John to participate, for all of you watching at home, for all of you being here. We're also incredibly grateful to the White House Historical Association. I'd like to invite Red Wilson up to say a few words. Red is the Senior Vice President, Chief Development Officer, spent 16 years in academia and is a former member of City Council from his hometown in Arizona. I know you're a history buff, so I wanted to make sure you knew that about right. Stop the steal. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome again to the White House Historical Association. Uh, we are delighted to have John Meacham here with us again, and he's been here several times over the years, and I consider him a friend uh, to the association and a friend to our mission. For those of you who have not been to the White House Historical Association before, uh, I'd like to just give you a brief thumbnail about what it is. Uh, we were founded by First Lady Jacqueline Kenney, Kennedy when she moved into the White House in 1961. Since the founding of the White House Historical Association, our role has been to enhance the public's understanding of White House history, but also to maintain virtually everything you see once you walk through the door at the White House. So the carpet you're looking at, the wall coverings, the art on the walls have been maintained entirely through private dollars since 1961, and much of what is on display in the White House has been acquired uh, since 1961. And we have worked with 12 presidents and first ladies. And uh, I myself have been here for three uh, first families. We are a nonpartisan and we are a nonprofit. And to that point about being a nonprofit, 
significant amount of what you see here are, are five buildings on this campus as well as one I'm about to mention is maintained largely through philanthropy. And so what you're, you're seeing here is maintained through donations uh, and then also the sale of, uh, of retail items, particularly our Christmas ornament. I should mention our shop is open here <laughs> and there is a discount um, for those who are attending today. As we conclude, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to a video which uh, is going to give you a preview. And I'm so glad that you're here to see this, John, because what we're doing underscores what you do and will also, I think, help the work of historians like you live longer. This project that we are launching in essentially 19 weeks over here at 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue, this project has one primary objective, and that is to increase and enhance the enthusiasm that Americans, particularly young Americans, have for American history and the institution of the White House. And so with that, I'd like to cue the video and we'll give you a preview. So Ken, thanks for working with us on this and CAA as well. And uh, John, it's always good to see you and thanks for what you do. I'd like to acknowledge uh, folks that are with us today, the McGee family who have been big supporters of our uh, project at 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue and as well as uh, their fellow National Council members, Susan Scott, B. Welters, Nancy Voorhees, and Ann Lantry. And don't forget the discount in the shop next door. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, folks.